Oh, what a lover dub dub, motherfuckers. What is going on? Is everyone boy? The everyone favorite jack of all trades with a foul mouth, Common Durbin. And today, like I promised you, you know, like I promised you in the um, in the video Living Legend, I'm gonna read this book to you guys. And this is a true story about escaping Titanic. A young girl's true story of survival. Story by Mary Beth Lo Lobecki. Illustrated by Corey S. Heinzman. And of course for, you know, the read along, I've got my cool coin and I got my replica bell. So let's go ahead and fucking jump into this shit. Alrighty. Escaping Titanic, a young girl's true story of survival. There we go. April 10th, 1912. On a train from London, 12-year-old Ruth Becker spied the RMS Titanic. It rose like a city on the sea, 11 stories high and 4 blocks long. It was the biggest, fanciest, most expensive ship ever made, built to be unsinkable. But Ruth, ha but to Ruth, the Titanic was just another ship. And after a month at sea, Ruth was sick of ships. Ruth missed her warm home in India and her father. He was a missionary and had to stay behind it. In her coat pocket, Ruth kept safe the handkerchief he had given her. Two mighty blasts, yeah, two mighty whistles blasted. Time to board. Ruth and her four-year-old sister Mary and I, the other passengers, the first-class women, strolled around. Yeah, strolled aboard with their furs and hats. Nearby trudged the third-class families in scarves and caps and boots. Once aboard, Mother held baby Richard tight. She pulled an officer aside. I'm not one bit happy about being on this ship, she told him. I'm nervous because it is its first trip. Ruth sighed. Must Mother always worry? The Titanic has watertight compartments. If anything does happen, they'll keep the ship upright until we get help the man said. While Mother fretted, Ruth and Marion ran ahead to find their cabin on F deck. Ruth had never seen such riches. The ceramic sink bowl sparkled, the carved wooden beds gleamed, and the crisp new sheets smelled like flowers. She knows how the ship's engines hummed like the grasshoppers back home in India. Days passed, each one offering new places to explore, the fancy dining room, the library, the decks. Ruth pushed a carriage holding Richard. Everyone they met seemed happy to be on this famous new ship. The other kids exploring, the stylish older ladies and the handsome young men flirting with them, and the sweet older couples. On Sunday, the fifth day at sea, the Atlantic Ocean looked as gentle as a pond. Ruth paused in the crisp evening air. Frost crystals whiskered the railing. The steam engines pulsed loudly, the ship steadily breathing. Miss Becker, is everything well? asked the young officer. Very well, thank you, answered Ruth, as she watched the sun painted gold, a gold path across the water. Like I said, these are fucking awesome illustrations. Just after midnight on Monday, Ruth and Mother woke to silence. The humming engines had stopped. Yelling and footsteps soon echoed in the hallway. The writer says, Monday, April 15, 12 a.m. Ruth's mother jumped up and flung open the door. A cabin steward uh, calmed her. There's just been a little accident and they're going to fix it. We'll be going on in a few minutes. Ruth laid down, but the engines didn't start up again. The ruckus outside the cabin door grew only louder. Hissing steam howled like a siren. What was going on? After 20 minutes, another steward appeared at their door. Put on your life belts and get to the boat deck immediately. Ruth rushed to help dress Marion and Richard, then she draped her coat over her nightdress and stepped into her shoes. In such an excited rush, she forgot her life belt. Ruth and her family trailed the steward up many flights to a, dex, to a deckside room. Other women and children waited there. Some were crying. We've hit an iceberg, Ruth heard one woman say. Some passengers claim it wasn't safe on board the lifeboats. They could see another ship on the horizon and would wait for it to rescue them. After all, the Titanic couldn't sink. But Mother was adamant. I want to get off this ship, she said. While officers helped the first-class women and children into the boats, Mother worried about the cold and she thought there was time. Ruth, would you run back to our room and get three blankets, she had asked. 
Ruth edged against the crowd, down five flights to their cabin, then she made her way back to the boat deck. A band was now playing lively music, while flares were fireworking into the sky. People pushed, hollered, and searched for family and friends and news. Who could tell them what was really going on? Near one lifeboat, Ruth saw officers holding back the men, even boys about her age. Mothers were tried pulling in their sons and husbands. The men, though, were saying, Don't worry, we'll meet you when we save by another ship. Ruth was now glad her father was not on the Titanic. 1.25 a.m. Breathless, Ruth reached her mother just as officers were passing Richard and Mary into lifeboat 11, which was already being lowered down. That's all for this boat, this George yelled. Please let me in, Ruth's mother pleaded in loudly. Those are my children. The steward picked her up and dropped her in. As mother looked up, she saw Ruth still standing on the deck. She shrieked in terror. Ruth was now alone on the Titanic. 1.30 a.m. From the darkness below, mother's scream pierced the air. Ruth, get into another boat. Ruth spotted lifeboat 13 being roped down. She zigzagged to a kind-looking young steward. May I please get in this one? Sure, he said. She was the last person allowed on. When lifeboat 13 hit the water, it was swept under another lifeboat being lowered. Two seamen shouted, One, two! They slashed 13's end rope and the boat shot free. Here we go. On the ship, the band now played slow, prayful songs. All the lifeboats gone. People lined the Titanic's tiled, tilted decks, calling for help. Many leapt off, aiming for the fleeing lifeboat. The roof feared their lifeboat would be swamped. Some boilermen grasped an ice lifeboat's oar. They rowed as fast they could towards safety. Roof looked back. The Titanic's port windows slipped slowly underwater, one by one. The ship's lights blazed in the moonless night. The black, calm sea reflected them like stars. How strange, thought Ruth, that the ship could look so beautiful, yet so terrible. 2.20 a.m. Then something exploded, a blast rocking the night. Ruth watched in horror. The, fir the front smokestack crashed down, and the Titanic's nose plunged into the sea. A wrenching of metal and wood sliced the ship in half. Out went the lights. The rear of the ship rose skyward. Ruth could hear dishes and glasses smashing, furniture crashing, people screaming for help. The lights flashed on again. The stern stayed up for a minute or so, standing on its ripped end, people falling into the black water. Then darkness folded them all in, and the ship dropped into the deep. Now Ruth heard the most horrible noise she could imagine. Hundreds of people struggling and freezing in the icy water, gasping and wailing for help with curses and prayers. Ruth could do nothing. Then slowly, a deathly quiet blanketed the water. Ruth couldn't turn her mind away from the enormous flock of floating bodies. Even as the night chill knifed at her own hands and feet, Ruth tore apart her blankets to warm the rowers. When an oarsman cut his finger, Ruth quickly wrapped it with her father's handkerchief. Gradually, the lights of the ship they were rowing toward dimmed and vanished. Ruth closed her eyes and prayed for some sign of hope. There was nothing but darkness. 4.30 a.m. The long, hopeless hours went on and on in some time. The cold and the cold and the cold. Ruth tried to comfort a woman weeping at her side. Finally, far up in the dark, she spotted a dot of light that grew brighter and larger. Ruth and her boatmates waved and screamed and waved some more. It was a ship. As the dawn glimmered, the men rowed with new energy. Ruth finally felt her hopes rising. When they reached the Carpathia side, the others wanted Ruth to board first. Her hands and feet were too numb to climb, so she was lifted in a rope swing. On the deck, a crewman embraced her with a blanket. For nearly four hours, Ruth wandered the ship, searching for her family. Lifeboats staggered in, but not number 11. At mid-morning, a woman asked, Are you Ruth Becker? Yes, she answered. Was her family gone? The woman touched her arm. Your mother's been looking everywhere for you. The mother swooped up Ruth into her arms. Ruth and her family were safe, but so many were not. Women and children watched for husbands, fathers, sweethearts, children, friends, staff. 
More than 1,500 people were still missing. The Carpathia picked up only 705 survivors. When the Carpathia docked in New York, thousands leaned toward the survivors with questions, wondering furiously who had lived, who had died, and what had happened. Everyone wanted to, Ruth to talk, but she kept quiet. It was the heart-numbing quiet of so many lost in the cold, dark, deep. April 10, 1912, Ruth and her family boarded the RMS Titanic at Southampton, England. April 14, 11.40 p.m., Titanic hits an iceberg on the starboard side. April 15, 12.05 a.m., Captain gives orders. Of course, 125, lifeboat 11, Ruth's family boats launched. 1.30 a.m., lifeboat 13, Ruth's boat was launched. 2.20, Titanic sinks. 4.30 a.m., Carpathia. And April 18th, the Carpathia reached New York. And here's an afterword. As an adult, Ruth Becker taught high school in Kansas and in Michigan. The Titanic, though, was not part of her history lessons. No one knew she'd been on it, not even her three children. In 1982, people started seriously searching for the sunken Titanic. New tools could help people explore the sea's bottom. The daily quiet in Ruth's head began to be filled with faces and voices, the sounds of people drowning, freezing. She remembered the young men and the fathers, the families from the lower decks, the couples who wouldn't leave each other, the crewmen and workers down below, the kind James, the kind James Moody who put, her life belt, who put on her lifeboat, or put her in the lifeboat. Perhaps it was time to tell their story. In 1982, Ruth joined other survivors at the Titanic Historical Society's convention to honor the 70th anniversary of the sinking. She let herself remember and tell what had happened on the Titanic. Three years later, the sunken Titanic was discovered. Ruth and the other survivors begged the world to honor the dead and not take things away from the site. She did not want the grave site disturbed. At the age of 90, Ruth boarded the first ship she had been on since 1912. Later that year, on July 9, 1990, Ruth passed away. She had asked to have her ashes scattered over the sea, right where the sunken Titanic. She wanted to join the others, and on April 16, 1994, she did. And there you go. There you have it, guys. It's the true story of Ruth Becker's miraculous escape from the Titanic. I hope you enjoyed the book. If you have any questions or comments about it, leave them in the comment section below and I'll get back with you. And as always, if you're new to the channel and like the shit I do, hit the fucking subscribe button, hit the damn notification bell, become a member of the Commodore's crew and never miss another video again. And until next time, this is Commodore Urban. Sam smooth seas and clear skies. Happy sailing with you. God bless all of you. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe. And just be yourselves. Until next time, anchors away, motherfuckers. And um, so long.